Okay, brothers and sisters, so we in uh, Isaiah 53, and I just wanted to continue on from when I was going over Psalms, and, you know, we were talking about the stripes, in which the term stripes in Psalms, is in regards to Psalms um, 29, I mean Psalms 89, excuse me, and 32, based off of the transgression of David and all that, going, it, it becoming from the line. That term stripes in that chapter, you know, in Psalms 89, is talking about the plague. And the differences between that word in that chapter and the word stripes in Isaiah 53, it's a different concepts. You feel what I'm saying? Meaning the whips, the wounds, you know what I mean? The blows that Yahweh Shai took from, from, the, from the, uh, the stripes. You feel what I'm saying? And... When you um, understand the definition of the word based in the Hebrew, in which it goes back to Karabra, I believe, is giving you understanding that it talks about the womb. The Hebrew word, uh, kabura, kab, kabura, kabura, yeah, kabura, C-H-A-B-B-U-W-R-A-H, I believe, kabura, which means wound or blow, whip, or strike, you feel what I'm saying? So uh, let's continue on in Isaiah 53 and 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, obviously, you know, the Israelites. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. You feel what I'm saying? So how could you have been, how could you be healed through a plague? That's how you know that it's, it's not talking about, you know, it's not, it's talking about the physical you feel what I'm saying? It's talking about the physical. It's not talking about it's not talking about it in a in a metaphorical form in regards to the, the plagues. It's talking about the understanding of the physical stripes, the physical whips that Yahweh Shai took, you know, when he was getting beat. You know what I mean? So that's what it's talking about. It's talking about the physical stripes, the physical whips, the strikes, the blows. So let's go back to Sirach. <clears throat> We're going to go to Sharak real quick. We're going to go to chapter 47. Yes, chapter 47 and 13 verse. Where it says, Solomon reigned in a peaceable time and was honored for the Most High made all quiet round about him. Which means, you know, that's what Solomon means. That he might build an house in his name and prepare his sanctuary forever. How wise... Was thou in thy youth and as a flood filled with understanding? Thy soul covered the whole earth, and thou fillest it with dark parables. For thy name went far unto the islands, and for the peace and for thy peace thou wast beloved. The countries marveled at thee for thy songs and proverbs and parables and interpretations. By thy name or by the name of the Lord Power which is called the Lord power of Israel, thou didst gather gold as tin and didst multiply silver as lead. Thou didst bow thy loins unto women, and by thy body thou wast brought unto subjection. Thou didst sustain thy honor and pollute thy seed, so that thou broughtest wrath upon thy children and was grieved for thy folly. So how the hell could Solomon be Christ in another life? This is obviously talking about the plagues of the house of David. Because what did David do? David worshipped women. Solomon worshipped women. They all fell to the woman. They was all weak to the woman. David, Solomon, all of them. That's why they fell because they put the woman above the heavenly father. Just like Adam. Christ never had sex. Christ never dealt with no woman. He came on the earth to do what he was ordered to do. So how the hell could he have been uh, somebody else in another life? It just doesn't make sense and it's blasphemous. It's blasphemous. It really is. It's nonsense. Solomon was a wise man. But he was not a righteous man because of his acts. He was an idolater. He was an idolater. 
And idolatry is one of the worst sins. Know what I mean? 1 Kings chapter 11 tells you that. He was, he was, a, he was a, a woman worshiper. In regards to when I say 1 Kings chapter 11 tell you that, I'm talking about the fact that Solomon was an idolater. Exodus 23 tells you that idolatry is the worst sin. Right? So let's go to Ecclesiasticus chapter 49. And we're going to go to verse 4. <clears throat> All except David and Ezekiah and Josiah were defective, for they forsook the law of the Most High. Even the kings of Judah failed. So Solomon forsook the law. David forsook the law. How could they have been Christ in another world? It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. 2 Samuel chapter 11 tell you that they forsook the law. Christ came on the earth to fulfill the law. That, that's how you know it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. Hold on, let's go to Matthew 5 and 17 real quick. Think, this is Christ, of course, you see it in red. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not in no wise pass from the law, to all be fulfilled. So Christ, so when they say in the church, oh, the law is done away with in the Old Testament, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. Because they don't know the Bible. So let's go to um let's go to Hebrews chapter two real quick. Yeah, we're gonna go to Hebrews. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to the Most High, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, the people being Israel. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, when you go to Matthew, the fourth chapter, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So how the hell could Christ be these people if he was, if he was able to basically... Get over, over temptation. But Solomon and David were tempted. Just like David, who killed um, Uriah, and slept with, Uriah and slept with his wife. And slept, slept with his wife and had a baby and killed that man. That's what David did. So like, how could he have been? How could have, how could Christ be him in another life? Well, he did something so wicked as that. When the Most High ordered him not to do so, and he did it anyway. Come on, man. But he was Christ, huh? It's nonsense, man. It's crazy. Well, Christ was David, huh? Christ was Solomon, huh? What type of bugged out shit is that? Like, they really teaching that stuff. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Let's continue on, though. Let's continue in, in um, let's continue on. <clears throat> so. Trying to um, continue. I'm trying to look over a certain. Um, hold on. 
Let's read this over again. Let's read this over again real quick. Because this is this is this is real heavy. And I feel like I haven't elaborated enough. This is really, really heavy though. So let's go to um let's go back up. For as much <clears throat> then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Right? And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Give you the understanding that Christ came on the scene in the fleshly form from the celestial form. So right here is just speaking from a celestial um, perspective. You know what I mean? Where it basically says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Because he came to give repentance unto the house of Israel, which is of the seed of Abraham. Know what I mean? He had to come into the flesh to take on the seed of Abraham. He had to be the reconcile. He had to be the reconciliation for the sins of Yahshua Allah. You know what I mean? Solomon couldn't do that. David couldn't do that. As per Sirach 49 and 4, he forsook the law, just like we read. Excuse me. So how could uh, he have been those people in another life if they sinned? And it tells you that Christ never sinned. Right? So you just got to like really put things in a proper perspective. So um, let's go to Philippians real quick. <clears throat> And we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2. And there's a reason why, it, you know, this is a must. So let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to go, we're going to go to verse 4. As a matter of fact, we're going to go to verse 5. We're going to go to verse 5. <clears throat> let this be, let this mind be in you, which also in Hamashiach Yehoshah. Who being in the form of the Most High, thought it not robbery to be equal with the Most High. Meaning that Christ sat on the right hand side of the Heavenly Father. Because him and the Heavenly Father are one. That's why, you know, he's the Son. The Most High, his Son. He sits on the right hand of the Heavenly Father. And the Most High utilizes Christ in the celestial form as well as the physical form. So that's, that's just that. That's just giving you that. You know what I mean? So do we see anything about Hamashiach appearing in the form of life? You know what I mean? We don't see none of that. We don't see anything about Hamashiach appearing in the form of life. It says in verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man when he came, you know, in a fleshly form, particularly when you read John 1 and 1 through 14, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Even the death of the cross. Now, I mean, so you see nothing about him being somebody else in the form of life. This is speaking from a celestial perspective, not from a fleshly or man's perspective. Now, I mean, so it's important for us to understand context. You know what I mean? We have to understand context. It's very, 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 very important. So um, now, <clears throat> let's get, uh, what else can we get? Let's get Wisdom of Solomon. Yeah, Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom of Solomon. Let's get the uh, 18th chapter. I'm going to start at the 12th verse. Yeah, we're going to get 18 and 12. Matter of fact, let's go, let's go to verse 11. Yeah, verse 11. So it says, The master and his servant were punished after one manner, and like as the king so suffered the common person. Right? 
So they all together had innumerable, innumerable dead with one kind of death. Neither were the living sufficient to bury them. For in one moment, the noblest offspring of them was destroyed. For whereas they would not believe anything by reason of the enchantments, upon the destruction of the firstborn, they acknowledged this people to be the sons of the Most High. So this is basically in reference to, in reference to the plagues that were put on Egypt when our people was held captive in Egypt. When you read the book of Exodus, this is giving you understanding of the death of the firstborn, meaning the Most High, the sons of God, is always referring to the Israelites. You feel what I'm saying? Because when you when you understand uh, the beginning, we understand Genesis one and one, and where it talks about you know, let's make man in our image. It's giving you understanding that the Most High set up Christ and the angels to create the heavens and the earth, so on and so forth, and man. That's why it says let's make man in our image, because the angels created the heavens and the earth. At the behest of the Heavenly Father. I mean. That's what it was. So from a proverb perspective. It is in reference to the angels. Which are manifestations of the sons of Israel. When you talk about the sons of God. I mean. And who smote the firstborn? It was Christ. It was Christ. So let's go to the wisdom of Solomon. Uh... Matter of fact, we're going to stay on chapter 18. Yeah, we're going to stay on chapter 18. We're going to continue on. For while all things were in quiet silence, and that night was in the midst of her swift course, <clears throat> thine almighty word leaped down from heaven out of thy royal throne. Going back to John 1 and 1 through 14, in Exodus 15 and 3. So the word was, has always been Christ. The word has always been Christ. Thine almighty word leap down from heaven out of thy royal throne as a fierce man of war into the midst of a land of destruction. Now, I mean, so that's talking about Christ. When it says the Lord is a man of war, it's talking about Christ. When you read Exodus 15 and 3. And brought thine unfeigned commandment as a sharp sword and standing up filled all things with death and it touched the heaven, but it stood upon the earth. Now, I mean. So verse 15, that's in reference to Yahweh Shah. Yahweh Shah is, is referred as a man of war. I mean, he was given the order from the Most High to smite the firstborn in Egypt, and he did that. I mean, so that's totally disparate from Yahweh Shah and Solomon in regards to their ordinances, in regards to what they were set up to be. You know what I mean? So let's continue on, man. Let's go to Matthew, the 12th chapter. Matthew chapter 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're going to get uh, verse 38. Let's get verse 38. All right. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Which debunks that whole Easter, Good Friday nonsense. You know what I mean? <clears throat> the men of Nineveh, shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold a greater than Jonah is here the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here and who was that greater than Solomon Christ a greater than Solomon is here I mean, so uh, let's continue on. Let's continue on in uh, what scripture can we get? What scripture can we get? Let's go to Romans. Yeah, we're going to go to Romans real quick. Let's get Romans. <clears throat> so we 
we're going to go to Romans chapter um, 5. Yeah, let's get Romans chapter 5. Start at verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when <clears throat> we were enemies, we were reconciled to the Most High by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in the Most High through our Lord, Yahweh HaMashiach, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That one man is talking about Adam, right? And this is just to bring home the understanding that, you know, Yahweh Shah was not reincarnated Adam. And, you know, we're about to prove that right now. So let's continue on to read. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. I mean, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come, meaning who was the fig Adam was basically the person that opened the door for sin. So a lot of people read where it says who was the figure of him to come to point out, oh, that's talking about Christ. You know what I mean? But it's clearly telling you that Adam laid the foundation for mankind to sin because of he and Eve's transgression. You know what I mean? Him and Eve fell because Eve, being the weaker vessel, was prone to deception. And Adam, being weak for Eve and putting her on a pedestal, they fell. You know what I mean? So this ain't telling you that he will be reincarnated as Yahweh. It's telling you. That Christ had to come on the earth to offset what Adam did. That's what it's telling you. He came to offset the transgression of Adam. So when it states that sin is not imputed when there is no law, then you have to be under the law to sin, which is the transgression. So when the law was given to Adam and Eve by the Most High and they transgressed, you needed a Messiah figure to offset that. You needed a Messiah figure to offset what the um what the decision was by Adam and Eve. And he was already ordained to come on the earth. You know what I mean? He was already ordained to come on the earth. Not me. So it's important for us to understand these things, man. Like the law, the law was given unto Adam and Eve by the Most High, and they transgress. They transgress. They were supposed to be fruitful and multiply. So sin became something natural. It wasn't natural until they did what they did. They opened the door for sin. Not me. Until you had the Mosaic Law, was which was bestowed upon us. You know what I mean. You read Deuteronomy, Exodus, Leviticus. <clears throat> now, I mean that that was the that was the fleshly covenant, and that's a whole different level of transgression or infraction against the heavenly Father. Now, I mean, but yes, you had to have Moses come and you know bestow these the covenant upon the um, children of Israel. You had to have all that. Just, and just to just to continue on with the sentiment of Adam and Eve opening the door for it, it tells you in Ecclesiastes twenty five and twenty. Well, twenty five and twenty four. Excuse me. Not me. So it's important for us to understand. That. Let's continue on though. Let's go to uh, Roman. No, I'm sorry. Let's go to Hebrews. We're gonna go to Hebrews four. Let's go back to Hebrews, and we're gonna get the fourth chapter. We're going to start on the 13th. Now, let's start on the 14th verse. The 14th verse. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Yahweh the son of the Most High, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, 
but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Right there. Right there. And it's giving you also understanding that he was tempted. Adam, Solomon, David, Rehoboam, they were tempted and they failed. Christ was tempted and he succeeded. You know, he overcame it. And Yahushua was a high priest under the order of Melchizedek, by the way. Not the Levitical priest. Because he ain't come from the line of uh, from Aaron. He ain't, he, you know what I mean? He didn't come from that line like the Levites. He came from the line of Judah, so you know what I mean. He he wasn't under the um, he wasn't the, he wasn't under that order. He was under the order of Melchizedek. So let's continue on. Um, let's get a <clears throat> let's get hmm. Let me see what we could get. Let's get um Ecclesiastes. No, as a matter of fact, let's get Second Ezra. Let's get Second Ezra. We're gonna go to the Apocrypha. So we're gonna get Second Ezra in the Apocrypha. Chapter three. Let's get chapter three. And we're gonna start on verse 19. Where it says, And thy glory went through four gates of fire and of earthquake and of wind and of cold, that thou mightest give the law unto the seed of Jacob, and diligence unto the generation of Israel. And yet tookest thou not away from them a wicked heart, that thy law might bring forth fruit in them. For the first Adam, bearing a wicked heart, transgressed and was overcome. And so be all they that are born of him. So a lot of brothers, you know, when they see the first Adam, that's what, that's what makes them think that, you know, Christ came in, re in, in, in a reincarnation form as Adam because it says the first Adam. But what a lot of people don't understand, which is which is a damn shame, is the fact that the term Adam literally means man. That's all it means. It means man. You know what I mean? Adam means man or like mankind. So the second quote unquote man is Christ. In verse 21, Christ was alluding to being born again through the word based off of the offsetting of the law. That's why it says, and so be all they that are born of him. You know what I mean? Just like when you read uh, John chapter 3, in which Yahweh Shah gives you understanding of what it means to be reborn again through the spirit. You know what I mean? I believe when uh, Nicodemus had inquired, when you read John chapter 3. So in order to be under the order of the second Adam or the second man, you would have to have this spiritual rebirth. I mean, so everything has to be understood with context, man. That's what it is. Everything has to be understood with context. That's what it's about. So let's go to um. We're going to stay on second edge. We're just going to go to chapter 4. And we're going to go to 30th verse. Where it says, <clears throat> For the grain of evil seed hath been sown in the heart of Adam from the beginning. And how much ungodliness hath it brought up unto his time, unto this time. And how much shall it yet bring forth unto the time of threshing come? So Adam, like, <laughs> Adam was so wicked that he laid the groundwork for everything wicked to come thereafter. If Adam never did what he did, there wouldn't be we wouldn't be in this condition today. There wouldn't be no wickedness. That's what the scripture is in reference to. I mean, and the reason why the wicked nature of man is going to persist is because you have to have prophecy come to fulfillment. Because these people, in regards to the people with the reprobate minds, they live in under the order of Adam, which is the spirit of idolatry and Luciferianism. Sin. Because he was taught these things by Eve, even though he didn't take heed to them, but he was taught. And he listened to her. Because he loved her more than he loved the Most High. His job was to tell her off. Put her in her place. Chastise her. He didn't do that. 
And that's why they fell together. That's why they fell. You know what I mean? But we wanna we wanna live under the the order of the second Adam. Not the first Adam, but the second Adam. Which is continual righteousness. You know what I mean? So uh let's continue on. Let's get um Let's get first Corinthians. Yeah, first Corinthians. Yeah, we're gonna get first Corinthians. And we're gonna go to chapter 15. Chapter 15 and verse 3. Let's start on verse 3. Alright. <clears throat> we're gonna start on verse 3, where it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Hamashiach died for our sins according to the scriptures. And you can read that in Acts 5 and 31, Matthew 15 and 24. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas or Kephas. Then of the twelve, meaning the twelve apostles. Right? After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are falling asleep, meaning the ones who died. You feel what I'm saying? So when it says some are falling asleep, it's talking about the ones who died. And after that, he was seen of James, then of the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also. It's talking about uh, Pete, Paul. Paul speaking here. As of one born out of due time. Right? Let's continue on. For I am the least of the apostles. That I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of the Most High. Meaning, he killed the uh, the Israelite uh, followers of the Heavenly Father. You know what I mean? That's what he did. By, by the grace of the Most High, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of the Most High which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preached and so ye believed. Right? Now, if Yahweh shall be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Right? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Hamashiach not risen? And if Hamashiach be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. Right? Come on, man. Let's continue on, though. Ye, and we are found false witnesses of the Most High, because we have testified of the Heavenly Father that he raised up Hamashiach, whom he raised not up. If so, be that the dead rise not. Right? And once again, just going back to uh, verse 12, when the scripture is referencing coming back, you know, it's always talking about resurrection. It's always talking about resurrection. I mean. And also to go back up to um, chapter, I mean, verse 10, where, you know, Paul is talking about how but by the most high. But by, you know, the grace of the Most High, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of the Most High which was with me. So, every, you know, it's all about giving that praise to the Heavenly Father. Now, I mean, that's in Acts 9. Now, I mean, that's in Acts 22 and that's in Acts 26. In regards to the grace that was given to uh, Yahweh Shah. I mean, to Paul. So, let's continue on. When he saw Yahweh Shah, when he saw Yahweh Shah. So we're going down to 16. For if the dead rise not, then is not Yahweh Shah raised. And if Yahweh Shah Hamashiach be not raised, your faith in, is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. So in order for Hamashiach to be an entity that is believed upon, I mean, which is, which, which, which is something that's foreign to a lot of people. He had to be. He had to. He had to have been risen, resurrected. Know what I mean, he had to have been resurrected in order for him to have been believed upon. So 
So let's go down. I just went down a little bit too far. A little bit too far. All right, so let's continue. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Hamashiach are perish. So that's going to that's going into the ones who believed and died, meaning either they were murdered or they died natural deaths. Now I mean, so let's go to nineteen. If in this life only we have hope in Hamashiach, we are all we are of all men most miserable. But now is Hamashiach risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now, I mean, the first to be resurrected from the dead, you know, that basically giving hope to those who have died in his name to be resurrected. That's all that is. That's all I was talking about. It's always going back to resurrection. It's always going back to resurrection. I mean, for sin by man came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. Even so, in Hamashiach shall all be made alive. So it's just giving you the discrepancy, the distinction between living under the order of the first man and living under the order of the second man. I mean, it wouldn't emphasize two beings or two entities if this person was reincarnated. You feel what I'm saying? That's how you know that reincarnation is bullshit, man. It's bullshit. Excuse my French, but it's, 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 it's nonsense, man. It's nonsense. But every man in his own order, Hamashiach the first fruits afterward, they that are Hamashiachs at his coming. Right? Let's continue on verse 24. Then cometh the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom of the Most High, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, and all authority and power, for he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. Not me. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So this is in reference to Revelation 20. Not me. Which is an allusion to the second death, which is the second resurrection. So Revelation 20 is an allusion to the second resurrection, not reincarnation. The second death meaning resurrection. Resurrection. I mean, let's go to uh, let's go down. Actually, we're gonna stay here. Let's go down. But some men will say, "How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come?" Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it dies. So in order for a body to be risen, it has to be dead. It's not going to, the, the, the soul is not going to be transferred to another body. It's, it's just, come on, man. It's crazy. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body thou shalt be. But rare grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. I mean, but the Most High giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another fish, another of fishes, and another of birds. Right? There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Just giving you understanding, like as an aside, like we know that, you know, we could we could provide additional substantiation and all that. This pretty much nullifies the evolution doctrine. You feel what I'm saying? We all like animals are different than humans. There's no, you know, we we come from animals or or none of that nonsense. I mean, we come we came from the first man. We all come from Adam. That's what it is. We all come from Adam. So let's continue on. Uh, we on verse 40. There are also celestial... No, we on verse 41. Sorry. Glory. I mean, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star different from another star in glory. Know what I mean? So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in corruption. So 
So basically, when resurrection comes, the hopeful elect will receive the celestial body. The same body that Hamashiach had when he was resurrected. The same body that Adam and Eve had before their fall. And the same bodies that the sons of Israel had in regards to the angels who came to Abraham to eat with him. Before they destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Know what I mean? Same bodies. Same bodies, man. Let's go to Luke 24 real quick. Luke 24. I'm over here passing scriptures and all that. Excuse me, brothers. Yeah, Luke 24. <clears throat> Go to 36 verse. 36. And as they thus spake, Yahweh himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he had said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit have not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? Not me, he wanted to eat. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I speak unto you, which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the laws of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, concerning Yahweh HaMashiach. Right? Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. All nations, talking about all the nations of Israel. And ye are witnesses of these things. Like this is, this is why like. When you go through the Gospels and all that, you start to understand why many of like the disciples asked him so many questions in regards to Christ. Why they asked him so much questions? Because they wasn't aware. It wasn't they. They wasn't given a proper understanding. That's why it says, "Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures." You feel me? So, like when you read the Book of Acts in the second chapter, Yahweh shall bless his disciples with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes they, they still needed counsel. They still needed some, some sort of teachings. Know what I mean? So let's continue on. And this just goes, this just takes it home in regards to it, it talking about resurrection. Talking about resurrection. Know what I mean? Talking about resurrection. So let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to get verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Yahweh HaMashiach, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the work in there whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So when it says vile body, it's talking about our natural body, which is distinguished from the glorious body, which is the celestial body. So in order for Yahweh Shah to subdue the nations, uh, I think you can read that in Psalms, the second chapter. Yeah, Psalms, the second chapter. In order for him to do that, he would have to have the glorious body. You know what I mean? So just giving you an understanding of the celestial form and the physical form or the celestial form in regards to the celestial body. Or you 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 going into torment based off of the conduct on this earth. So that's why we gotta follow the Heavenly Father. We gotta, you know, we gotta adhere to the law, statutes, and commandments to the best of our ability, man. It's very, very, very important. So let's go to First Thessalonians real quick. Get first Thessalonians. And we're gonna get uh 
chapter 4. Let me go to the 13th verse. Alright, so <clears throat> we're going to read from 13 to 16. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Yahawashah died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yahawashah would the Most High bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Most High, that we which are alive and shall remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the, angel, of the archangel, and with the trump of the Most High, and, of, and the dead in Yahushua or Hamashiach shall rise first. Once again, once again, once again, those that are dead will be resurrected. They're not going to be reincarnated. They're going to be resurrected when the Lord comes particularly. Now, I mean, continuing on in verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Most High in the air or the Lord in the air. And so shall, and, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So this is Paul referencing the first resurrection right here. I mean, which is, uh, you know, in Revelation 20 and 4 and 6. I mean, let's go. Let's go to Revelations chapter 20. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon, that sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them. That will be headed for the witness of Yahushua, and for the word of the Most High, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Yahushua or Hamashiach a thousand years. And that's just giving you understanding of what's prophesied, what's coming, you know, and you know, in regards to that kingdom, you know, Jacob's kingdom. So, uh. Let's continue on, yeah. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. That's what that's talking about. The first resurrection. That's not talking about reincarnation, man. It's talking about resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection. On such the second death have no power. But they shall be priests of the Most High and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this talks about the thrones and they that set upon them after the first resurrection. Excuse me. You <clears throat> know what I mean? So now, uh, let's continue on. Let's continue on, man. I think I got a few more I could um, get into just to further prove my point. So let's go to Matthew uh, chapter 19. Yeah, because this, this is in regards to why brothers like to conflate uh the word regeneration into reincarnation. So we're going to get Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to start at verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Yahweh shall said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit in twelve thrones, shall so sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Right? So many brothers, they like to take the word regeneration and they like to apply it to the concept of reincarnation. They like to do that. I mean, and, re and regeneration has nothing to do with reincarnation in regards to like the spiritual regeneration. You feel what I'm saying? Regeneration is just basically you reforming yourself. That's all. It, that's all it's about. Reforming your mind. You know, you probably you probably find other scriptures where regeneration is not applied to resurrection, but a concept of being renewed through the word. That's what it's talking about. So, to be regenerated is just in reference to you know you reforming your mind. You feel what I'm saying? That's all it's talking about. So, um, in, in verse 29, and everyone that have forsaken houses 
or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit ever, inherit everlasting life. That's why we cannot put anything of the flesh on a pedestal, man, because these things change over time. You got to put the Heavenly Father first. That's what it's about. You got to put the Heavenly Father first, man. It's important. It's very, very important.